And then I remember once at Nasty Anna, I was in the hotel room with them, and I said, Nasty Anna said, I won every championship except the, um, such and such a championship. I can't remember what it was. And I said, why didn't you lose? Why did you lose that one? He goes, I don't know. Who cares? Let's just move on. And I thought, I wow, that. that's, that's, that's epic. That's the, that's the mind you have to have. Yeah. At least 10 years, right? Since the last time I saw you? At least. Right? Yeah. I was in Malibu. Malibu. You were doing your stuff and I was mm -hmm. doing nothing working out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, here's a question. Let's, let's get back to the basic. We met, is it you know, 25, 30 years ago? Yeah. Well, probably, I think I arrived in L.A. in 95, my, probably 98. 97. Yeah, 97, 98. 97, right? Yeah, yeah, so. And then you're the first person, I, I was doing martial arts, and we'll talk about that a lot today. Um, I had been doing martial arts at the dojo then for like almost eight years. Uh -huh. And I have a big dojo, West LA and all that stuff. Now, nobody in this country helped me get in a magazine. Uh -huh. The very, very first story that I ever got published was because of you. <laughs> So you came and now, did, how did we meet? Do you remember, was it, what, who was the guy from Black Belt Video? Mm, oh, yeah. Wasn't um, it him? Mm -hmm. We should insert that here <laughs> on an edit because. Yeah, um, but I, I don't remember, oh, who did Black Belt Video again? Um, I forgot his name. Really mm -hmm. nice guy. And he did powerlifting, mag powerlifting as well, yeah. right? Yeah. But I just don't remember. Well, anyway, so I think that's how we met. That's how we met. But but yeah, I think we got introduced that way. And then you were also very close to where I lived. Okay. And I was looking at dojos in the area. Yeah. And um, you were at this um, sports... Sports Club LA. Sports Club LA. Yeah. Which is now... Equinox. Equinox, yeah. yeah. I started the martial arts program in 89. 89. When I first got back from Switzerland. Wow. And you came over from England, right? Yeah. You were living in England full time there, but you'd been back and forth. I've been competing in mm -hmm. America for years. Right. But um, I decided to live here and we came in 95 mm -hmm. and then we stayed. We officially got our green cards in 97. Okay. Um, and when I say we, uh, my wife at the time. Right. And um, my children. Well, my son already had his passport. He did. He already had his passport. Yeah. Okay, is he American or is he, is he's, he British? He's both. Okay. He's got, got citizenship. Yeah, everyone's got dual citizenship. Nothing better than that. It's right? a blessing. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And when did you, we're going to talk about your book. Yeah. Okay, because you, this is your second book you wrote. Yeah. And I read the first one, Warrior Within, which is, is that still available? It's still available, yeah. Okay, so if you love martial arts, I mean, this is definitely the book to read because mm -hmm. um, it tells some amazing stories of you. Mm -hmm. and just being a warrior mm -hmm. and I think you know usually these podcasts are always about dogs things but people are always interested in what what makes me up and what makes me up is martial arts and the people that I love and you, you've always been not only a friend but but just somebody who I really admire because your mm -hmm. drive and your dedication and you're a world champion martial artist I mean you're the best of the best of the best and that's what I want to talk about today a lot because that mindset, yeah. right? The warrior mindset is what separates us from people who are lazy, right? People who don't. And I think it's it is a degree of laziness. I mean, there's a lot of luck. I mean, we're up. We got great opportunities. We're blessed in our in our lives and how how we brought up. But how much of it do you think is luck, and how much of it do you think is hard work? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's mostly hard work. Yeah, I mean, and I don't know if it is luck in competition because it's always about who it has more desire mm -hmm. and who is trained harder and who has that mental attitude. And that's why I wrote that book called The Warrior Within because um, I remember I was fighting on the circuit and I had already established myself as a champion and I'd really um, gotten in a, an amazing position as being the number one fighter in, I think I'd already won my first world championship. So it was, I was in a great strong place. And then one day I was at a competition and one of the guys said to me, when you, when's your book coming out? And I, I just immediately said, uh, it's on its way. And then he said, great. And then I thought, why did I say that? I've got to write a book now. <laughs> right. What year was that? That was probably about 84. 
84, 85, uh-huh. 80, could be 85, 86. Okay. And, uh, yeah, 85, 86. And then I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to write a book, what am I going to write a book about? I mean, okay. I could write technique, I could do kicks, I could do punches, I could do blocks, I could do fitness. And I thought, well, what's the main thing that's changed me mm. and made me a champion? What's the one thing that is more important than anything? If I had to only have that one thing, what would it be? And I thought, it, it's my mind, it's how I think, because it was my mind that changed everything. Yeah. I remember when I was fighting, I was always trained. I always trained hard. I mm-hmm. always trained. You know how we're crazy, right? Martial artists, yeah. we go out, <laughs> beat and think our right. hands with pieces of wood and yeah. punching walls and yeah. all this kind of crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> What's wrong with us? Right. So um, I would train like crazy. Yeah. And uh, crazy training, just as you you understand that. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but I'd always come like, I'd win sometimes, but then I'd lose. And then mm-hmm. I'd come third. Then I'm going to get third beaten in the first round, then I might be. And one day I just realized I was trying too hard. I was going like, man, you're just trying, you got everything. Mm-hmm. You're fitter than most. You're dedicated. You get up at 5 a.m., you run, you do all the things that like, they're still sleeping and you're just, you're already right. running down the streets and yeah. you're only 14 and 15 <laughs> and 16 years old, I'm thinking. And then one day, and it was the first ever and this is in England. It was the first ever national event where they were, for the first time, bringing all the different styles mm-hmm. together. And it was called the FSK, the Freestyle Karate Circuit, mm-hmm. which was the equivalent of the American NASCAR, North American yep. Sports Karate Association. Right. So this was huge for England. Mm-hmm. So the timing was perfect because on the very first event, and all of the best champions were there in England, all the greatest, all the people I used to read in magazines, looked up to, they were all there, they were all fighting, they were all... And then I said to myself, damn it, I'm just going to have fun. I'm just going to go out and have a good time today. Mm. So I went out and for the first time, I started smiling when I was fighting and I started to relax. And then everything just came together. And I just beat everyone on that day so easily. And then that changed my, my, that changed my career. It was from there, it was like a rocket launching. That was 85. That was 85, yeah, mm-hmm. that was 85. It was actually the beginning, it was actually 84. And then uh, for th- consecutively for, for years after that, I was maintaining. And I won my first champ- world championship in 85. Mm. And that was all leading to that. But it was all about changing your mind. But talk about that. Yeah. Talk about that. Let's talk about changing your mind because I think it's, is it a decision? Is it an epiphany? Like. Is it, do you have to be open to it? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think there's a lot of those You have to be open to it. You have to be open to it. Well, the thing is with fighters, uh, we're so aggressive. And, um, you know, that strength, and we have strong strength, right? And we go with all our strength to, and conviction in the fight. But that can be, that can actually work against you because you're pushing so hard that you're restricting yourself in ways you don't realize. It's, yeah. it's, it's hard to see it. On the on the outside, it just looks like you've got you got a great fighter with a big heart who's mm. pushing and is strong and is ferocious. But on the inside, you could be restricting a lot of things. And then I used to think I used to follow Muhammad Ali, mm-hmm. and I'd see how he'd always be joking. And he'd be fighting these big monsters, these guys, and he'd be joking and laughing. So I stopped putting some of that in there, and it just freed me up. It just made me more. It made me, made me, if I was already fast, I was three times faster right? because I was laughing while I was doing it and smiling at guys. And, and that happened in 84. That's when you had that transition, that yeah. epiphany. Yeah. And was Ali your motivation in that because he was always sting like a butterfly? Right? Uh, yeah. Butterfly like the, Ali, uh, was, Ali was one of my huge inspirations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then I must tell you about Nat, Steve Anderson, Nasty Anderson. Nasty Anderson. Well, he, um, in 84, in 83, he was coming to England with the U.S. team to fight in the World Championships. So I wasn't yet fighting on the World Championship. I was in the, I was in the squad. Mm-hmm. It's a little, I hadn't quite crossed over. I was a little mm-hmm. young for it, but I felt I was good enough. But they said, who, you know, I, I agreed. I volunteered to be one of the guys to go pick up the U.S. team. A couple of the okay. U.S. team members. So I drive up there with my car, and I wind up getting Nasty Anderson in my car, 
and uh, Tony Palmore, who is a heavyweight for contact champion. And Steve Anderson, of course, is a mm-hmm. is a legend. So I've got okay. these two guys in my car, and I'm like, I'm 19 years old, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm driving, and they're, they're talking, and they like they took me under. They're like, Hey, you got to do this, kid. Have you heard of the blitz? Let me show you the blitz. Let me do this. This is a knee slide jab. So we pull over. They show me techniques, and they come on, kid. And they were like, just loving me and showing me stuff. And then I remember once at Nasty and I was in a hotel room with them, and I said. Nasty Anna said, I've won every championship except the, um, such and such a championship. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what it was. And I said, why didn't you lose? Why did you lose that one? He goes, I don't know. Who cares? Let's just move on. And I thought, I wow, that. that's, that's, that's epic. That's the, that's the mind you have to have. Yeah. So I, I combined that with, with that attitude of like, all that matters is winning. Mm-hmm. And then you got Muhammad Ali in the background with his fun and games. And I was also, to add to that, uh, which is kind of ironic because it's the same kind of guy that I was Mm -hmm. when I picked up the U.S., you know, Steve Anderson and Tony Palmore. Um, A couple of years earlier, I was at a European championship and the guy, there was this one guy who picked us up and I was in the car and I was fighting and I think I got beaten in the second round or something. And then I noticed that one of the competitors who were fighting was a guy that picked us up mm-hmm. at the at the state at the car, uh, at the uh, hotel at the um, airport. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh man, let me tell you. Have tea. I'm gonna have a cup of tea. <laughs> well, the bottom line is, this guy was fighting and he was fooling around with everyone. He was joking, he was mm. playing, and I, I looked at him and think, man, how can you be so good if you're fooling around while you're fighting and you picked this up at the airport? So you can't be that good if you pick this up from the airport, you know. You just, yeah. uh, you know. But he he won the category. His division, I think, is a middleweight or something. Mm-hmm. He was like amazing. He's kicking every one, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I thought, oh, you know what? He's doing what Ali does. He's doing what I've been thinking of doing. Mm-hmm. This is gonna be a magic key. And that was your magic key, right? That was the thing yeah. that took you from teeter tottering to. The yeah. stri- is that when you when you got the Jedi? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had the Jedi already. You did. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I was always a good competitor, mm-hmm. very good competitor. And I was with, um, we were making a team, the Southeast Martial Arts team. So we had um, a few of the guys at my um, apartment in London, and um, we were making up names. So we had the Fall Guy, and then we had the um, Hitman, and we had. <laughs> you know, different other guys. And I thought, what can I be? I mean, just seeing Star Wars, I said, I'm going to be the Jedi. That's funny. The Jedi, yeah. So, and that's stuck. It's stuck, it's yeah. Stuck all the way through. You know, it's kind of crazy, though, because it's kind of funny because you choose names that you think are just names, but sometimes they're much more than that. I think that name chose me somehow. Yeah. Because when I think about what the Jedi is, and I think about my journey through my life at this point, um, that I can see that the philosophies of the Jedi, let's talk about the philosophies of the Jedi. Yeah, let's talk about it. So the Jedi, if you take a look at the uh, storytelling, mm-hmm. uh, the Jedi comes from, um, obviously, George Lucas, who his work derives from James Cam- uh, uh, Joseph Campbell, mm-hmm. who talked about the mythologies and the, you know, the different archetypes. You never hear much about Joseph Campbell anymore. I read so much of his stuff. It's so epic, so amazing, right? Yeah, amazing. So, are you in, or were you into, or are you into now that whole space travel thing? Uh, what space travel? Exactly. Yeah. Well, like I've got this thing, Dan, and tell you, I I love watching at night anything that deals with the universe, mm-hmm. the, the, the the going between planets, and, and like going to a different. Uh, the, the universe being composed of galaxies and these galaxies with these yeah. solar systems. I'm mesmerized by our existence, yeah. our tiny existence on this tiny blue planet, mm. right? In this tiny solar system, in this galaxy. I mean, it just keeps going, right? It's 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 infinitesimal, right? I mean, are you into that? I agree. That? Oh yeah. You oh, do. I'm into it big time, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it's mind blowing. It's right? mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things to look at. I mean, if you think, but I think this is a, this goes into a bigger conversation. Yeah. 
about humanity, becoming conscious of of uh, our existence, and you just said it perfectly. Yeah. You know, the more we learn, the more unconscious we become, and then humanity's, you know, growing to are uh, getting to different levels. Let's talk about that in the martial arts. I think back when we were training, and mm -hmm. I know you. The first class you took was a judo. Was a judo class? Was it? First class I did was kung fu. Oh, kung fu. Yeah. That's right. You, and you yeah. talked a lot about that yeah. um, in your book, which we're going to talk about in a sec. But my first thing was a judo class, right? So and yeah. I think we started the martial arts kind of similarly. Yeah. And um, I, I really want to talk about that because I, I I always say this. I see people now, kids, mm. all hooked in video games, yeah. all you know, complaining about being bullied, all. You know, I, I just don't see that fire. Yeah. Right. And when I got to this country, I got picked on. I got the crap beat out of me mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. I got called a kraut, a Nazi. You mm -hmm. know, I got called this. I got called that. When you were young mm -hmm. and you were in England, mm -hmm. you. I want, I want you to talk about that. I want you to talk about because that's so many points of your book. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's called "These Are African Hands." That's right. Um, just the title is. Incredible to me. I want to talk about Africa too in this conversation. If we have time, it might be like a six hour conversation. <laughs> but um, I, yeah. I want you to talk about where you were as a young boy mm -hmm. and your evolution. Why martial arts and how it drove you as opposed to your mom going into the school and saying, nobody's allowed to pick on my, on yeah. my son. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Talk about that because that's, it's, it's so incredibly similar to what I, what I went through. Yeah. And the opposite reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about that, like when you when you notice the color of your skin, yeah. and 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 yeah. that kids are making fun of you, yeah. and and that because it's it just mm -hmm. resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's like that old um, that old um, story mm -hmm. about the um, the the lion that grew or the or that. Different type of, let's just say, a cat grows up with a group of dogs, and they mm -hmm. think they're they're all the same. That the cat thinks it's just the same as the dog, right? Um, and then later you find out that you're something else. So that was that for me. Yeah. Um, uh, the reason why I'm, you know, I'm just, because this is a huge it's a huge subject. I'll I'll, I'll start it by saying. When you're when you're young, you don't know about racism. You don't know about color. Mm -hmm. And my grandparents, who were white, who raised me, we were we were all colorblind. And then when I became a teenager, that's when you realize you begin to realize that you're different from everyone else. Uh, whether it's the way people treat you, mm -hmm. or it's maybe it's your own perception of yourself. And I think in my case, my own perception of how I perceive myself was harder to deal with than necessarily how people were treating me. Because I did, I did get a little bit of, I did get some racism in Newcastle where I grew mm -hmm. up. But a lot of my struggles were self-perception and trying to find where my tribe was and how I fitted in and why I wasn't, I was different than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And it was a struggle. It was huge for me. Were you insecure? Yeah, I do. Yeah, totally. So you know how this goes. So we, so if you um, know it because you've experienced it for maybe if there are any anyone listening to this who hasn't, it's it's hard to explain. You just feel that for me that something is not in alignment. Something's not connected right. And you just don't know what that is. And at that at the age of 12, 13, 14 years old, you how do you fix those things? Yeah, you know, fix it. Yeah. Who who are you? How do you look at yourself? And you know I in my story, um, my grandparents raised me, as I said, and they were white. And I thought that my my real mother was my sister. So when I was around 12 years old, my grandparents told me that they're, we're not your real parents. We are your uh, grandparents, and your sister is your mother. 
So that was pretty confusing for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a lot of things to unpack. At the time, you think, oh, I can handle it. It's no problem. As long as I don't have to go and leave or give yeah. up my room or go right. some, <laughs> live in a hole. Right. Yeah. I was fine. I was fine with it. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is, you know, subconsciously, uh, you things happen. You get angry, you get resentment, you get distrust, and those things play out in your life as you get older, as you as you live your life. Um, so getting back to what you're saying, yeah, martial arts was my way, my mirror of um, dealing with everything that I was dealing with emotionally. You you made a couple of really good points though when when you started martial arts, and I think it's something that really. You know, I didn't have a dad when I was growing up, right? Yeah. Like I was, I, I knew, I knew I had a dad, but I never saw him. And so I, I just identified with this book on so many different levels. Um, was it the struggle, like, because if you kind of went into this after you found out that your grandparents weren't your parents, and, yeah. and that was it, like this self identity thing, like, like just trying to become? Because my thing was, and I think you, you could identify with it, was I was. I was a weak kid. I was an mm -hmm. asthma-ridden kid. I was mm -hmm. a nerd. I was a geeky kid. I was wearing German lederhosen, Birkenstocks, and like white socks, right? And going to school. My mother sending me off to school, like looking like a dork. Yes. And getting beat up. Oh. Uh, man. So it was hard, yeah. right? But yeah. I said inside, I thought, you know, there's something more. Yeah. Right. There's mm -hmm. something more. Mm -hmm. And I just tapped into this thing. But I didn't have a role model. I didn't have a dad. Like you, you had your grandfather, who was your father, yeah. who was raised you as a child, as a son. Yeah. Um, I didn't have that. I had this uncle who was like a father to me. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I need to be my own father. Yeah. Right? Did you do that? Wow. Um, no, mine was different a little bit. Okay. Um, because I think maybe because I had a gra my grandfather was totally took the place for me as I always thought he was my father. So that was, you know, I had that. Man, you know what? Listen, I've just got to say, they gave me so much love. Those They saved my ass. Mm. Your, your grandparents. My grandparents. Yeah. I could tell when I look back that if I hadn't have had them, God knows where I'd be. They saved my ass. Is your grandfather still around? No, they both come. Yeah, so sorry. Um, but they, you know, they just gave me so much love. And that's what they, that was being, has been my main navigation through all my issues, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and they gave me a lot of it. And I know what that looks like. Yeah. So uh, that was that was the main thing. But at the same time, what's make what makes it interesting is at the same time, and they were doing the best they could at the time. But in, at the same time, they were holding a secret from me. Um, Did you resent that ever? I didn't resent it, but I know it has caused some. Problems mm -hmm. that I've had, you know, I've had to learn about my life and overcome. I don't feel like I've ever had any resentment or anger toward them, mm -hmm. but I know that, you know, you you're dealing with a trust situation, yeah. you know, how, how to trust. So that has been one of the things I've had to learn about in my life. Trusting it comes through really well in the way you write about them. I mean, your yeah. love for your Parents, yeah, you have to call them that, was, was really evident because I didn't have that. I resented my mom for mm. taking me away from my dad and not letting my dad see me when I wanted to see him. And it is a long, long history of stuff. Yeah. And I think this book, your, your book, in searching for your father, mm -hmm. um, is just so powerful. I want to get on to it, but, but I want to talk more than much. So you, you, you got into Kung Fu and you, yeah. you had two instructors. You had one instructor who disappeared one day, right? Never came back and then somebody else took over. That's morning, right. Yeah. Right. right. You, which was, which was really, mm -hmm. no. So that was your primary training there. And then you went into boxing, right? Yeah. So the interesting part, I think, was marrying those two, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how, do you know a lot of people have done that? Because I don't know that many who have. I don't know either. Right. And not, I think, not on the scale that I did. Right. Yeah. But w did you ever favor um, the martial arts? Over, well, they're both martial arts. Did you ever yeah. you know, favor Kung Fu over boxing? Um, I think I did eventually because that was where I, I left. I left. I let go of the boxing and took it with me into the martial arts, into the Kung Fu, into the yeah, yeah. martial arts. 
um, that part of the martial arts. Um, so yeah, but I think the uh, what the boxing did for me, I had a choice actually. Yeah. When I was, I could have, I was asked if I wanted to be a professional fighter when I was like four, 16, mm -hmm. you know, and I was too young. We should be fighting a boxer. Yeah, mm -hmm. boxer. And then, but I had a, I had a dream to go and live in London and carry on with my, with Kung Fu and, and kickboxing and things like that. So, uh, that's when I made the choice. Talk about that. The difference between, cause I tried boxing. Yeah. I stopped that. I couldn't do it. There's such a difference, yeah. you know, in, in the various martial arts, but in, in this Western martial art of boxing compared to the Eastern martial art of Kung Fu or mm -hmm. karate or whatever. Um, was it hard when you were boxing to the different posture, the different assault phases, the different mm -hmm. foot movements and not being able to use your feet? And yeah. How did that work out for you? That's interesting, but um, I, I just threw myself in, in the boxing and forgot about all the Kung Fu moves and just solely worked on the the Western traditional boxing, and then it didn't. It wasn't a problem. It was something I could switch back and forth to, it's like a hybrid, you know. But there is a big difference, right? I mean, there's oh, a, huge, there's huge, difference. huge, huge, huge. You would see that. Yeah. And I remember, wasn't who was it? Was it Mayweather and and Conor McGregor? Yeah. It? Was it was it those two? Yeah. Who fought? And I thought, like, if you're going into this ring with a boxer, like, that's insane, yeah. right? To fight a boxer's fight in a boxing ring when um, you're not a boxer, yeah, it's just not going to happen. I know. Right? I mean, it's, it's, the boxer would never think about going the other way into a, into a grappling match with somebody, right? I mean, That's right. but I do yeah. think there's something about the, the, the mental strength of a boxer. Mm -hmm. It's kind of different. Mm -hmm. do, 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 you th do you think that I've never, I don't know much, much about boxing mm -hmm. except for being a big fan of boxing mm -hmm. and, and, and again, huge fan of of, of, of Muhammad Ali and, yeah. and, and, and Mike Tyson and yeah. these epic heavyweights. Yeah. And um, what is what is what is it about boxers that they just seem so tough yeah. mentally and physically, yeah. just really tougher than martial arts? I hate mm -hmm. to say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's you know it's a long lineage of um, punishing yourself mm -hmm. in boxing gyms, and it, and they go back. It for a way far back in the way they did with um, bare knuckle fighting, mm -hmm. and they they, they continue to um, pound each other, going in the gym, and the Queensby rules. I mean, I think they have a different ethic. Mm -hmm. But then again, saying that, I say that, and it, my, my, my mouth feels bitter because I think if you're doing martial arts on the right level, on this, you, you, they meet in the same place. Okay, you do. I do okay. think so. I think they meet in the same place. I think a lot of it, I mean, I think whether you're doing kumite, karate, mm -hmm. point fighting, or whether you're doing boxing, I think if you're at the highest level of those two um, types of sports, they meet in the same place with the um, amount of conviction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I just, I mean, there's just something about having watched Ali and having watched Mike Tyson's comebacks, yeah. which is yeah. incredible. Well, I think that is due to the fact, like, you know, those guys are training for 15 rounds of, of you know, endurance martial arts. Mm -hmm. It's not until recently we got MMA coming in where the martial, where the, come, you know, the what Eastern martial arts mm -hmm. has been combined over a longer period of time. But until then, uh, up until then, a lot of it was been kumite, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, there was kickboxing in the 70s, yeah, 80s. Yeah. That was great. Now, let's talk about that. I, do you have any idea why kind of had such a great... Um, there were scenes that had so much great potential. What did? Kickboxing. Oh, yeah. 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 Kickboxing had so much potential. It did. And it disappeared and MMA came in. MMA kicked its ass. Yeah. 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 I remember all the cage matches? Uh -huh. Tough men competitions and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I remember before I left Florida, coming out here in 80... 
at 80, 81, he did yeah. 83, and all the cage matches and, and, and all the fighting and stuff like that. It was just incredible. I thought, I think it didn't take off because the boxing commissions, I don't think the boxing commissions could make money on it. They couldn't sanction it. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And I think that's what really bit, um, bit UFC in, in, you know, or, or MMA in the ass early on. Yeah. And I didn't think it would take off. I never thought they'd get it past, past the boxing commissions. Yeah, they did. They're so powerful. Yeah. Right? I think Dana White did an amazing thing. I remember watching, I thought, it'll take a miracle to get, and I remember watching the first Hicks and Gracie and Kenny Shamrock fight. And I, I was, and, and, um, and, not Hicks and Gracie, Hoist Gracie, sorry. Yeah. And Hickson had a school down the street from, from my dojo. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was back in the day, and I thought, and I remember that a bunch of other ones came about, right? A bunch of other organizations came out, USC, and then all the other one, and, I mean, USC just dominated. What what year was that when uh, Gracie? That was was that nineties? Yeah, I would say it had to be in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, nineties. I remember. I mean, it's just so amazing to watch. I mean, I always thought that the the, the Gracie Jiu Jitsu was amazing. You know, I thought it was really something that you and I never. Yeah. You know, I mean, I knew a little bit about grappling, and we had some of it in the way in the way I taught, but their style. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, the, the, the ideas, the, the, the principles, the toughness, yeah. the mental toughness. And I think that goes back to the root of the kumite or the boxing, right? Yeah. Which, which that had a different level of toughness than the sport karate. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And I think that's what I admired about you because you had that toughness. You had the style of sport karate mm -hmm. and, and the flair and all that, which was so admirable. But you really... Had that mental grit, mm -hmm. right? Where you would just take those hits and take those hits yeah. and and not give up, yeah. right? How much of that do you, did did you harness from your childhood, from your core, from your from your, your training versus who you are as a person? The training is inspired. I mean, I unconsciously, I think I was definitely influenced by what I was going through as a teenager. Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes, kind of all fuels all of us. In my condition, I was living in a place where, you know, there was a lot of love, but there was a lot of violence, and I was angry about that. And I wished I could have, if, you know, my grandmother would get beaten up from my grandfather. Um, that was confusing to me. Mm -hmm. But, um, I couldn't do anything. I'd seen that for many years when I was a kid, from the age of about, you know, from this, when I was born. And so I think um, when I was fighting, unconsciously, I was using that um, unconscious need to protect my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of, it's, it was like a delayed reaction where I was able to do that in my comp tournament fighting. So I was kind of uh, putting it into re-channeling it, you know, the things I couldn't do as a kid, and I could, so I was kind of like champion, championing her, and that was driving me unconsciously, and it was only a few years ago when you realized these things. And then, of course, the other things, wanting to find my father, looking for my father, we all want to like make our fathers feel proud of us, and we kind of prove ourselves in our rites of passage. So I think that was unconscious. I know those things were driving me. But at the time, you don't think so. You don't think of anything about it. We're unconscious. So that's an interesting thing. And that's kind of what I got from reading your book. Um, you were driven by the past and the future, mm -hmm. right? You were caught in that middle space, right? Fighting your demons from when you were a child to fighting to find your father and to get that connection, which is so, so important for a boy, mm -hmm. right? To have that connection. I think <clears throat> it's something that I craved. And I think it's something every kid craves. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's so. I, I know it's kind of personal, but can you talk about like the, your relationship with your son because of your yeah. missing out with your dad? How did you catapult that and, and make that different with your son? Were you over, you know, involved with him, or like did you think God, I'm going to be the best dad? I'm going to be right on with him the whole time? Yeah, um, I wasn't like that. But I was aware, mm -hmm. I always ask myself, even right now, I'll ask myself, what am I, is there any part of that relationship of not knowing my father that's affecting me with mine? Mm -hmm. And I check it, I check myself now and again and have that conversation. Um, I don't know, 
I don't think it is has affected us in a, in a way. We've only had one fallout. Oh. Yeah, which was a few years ago. We didn't talk to each other for about a, almost a year. I had the same thing with my dad. I lost him for a year. Oh, yeah. man. It's the hardest thing, right? Yeah. But you can always make it up until they're gone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, exactly. How old is your son now? My son's uh, about 30. I think he's 30 now. Okay. Yeah. So you were in your 20s when you had yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, you get great contact with him. He's here in the States? He's in London. Oh, he's in London. Yeah. As he's well as there. your daughter. Yeah. They're both there. Yeah. That's amazing. And you, you love having him there? You ever want to be closer? Um, I love I love that they're there together, you know? Uh, so if anything goes down, hopefully they'll... Uh, I like to think that hopefully they'll... Um, look after each other. Yeah. Yeah. Are they close? They They are, but you know... Brothers and sisters sometimes, you know. You I know, think it's that age, though, because they're yeah. both in their 30s, right? They're yeah. both. Yeah. Well, she's, she's in her 20s. 20, yeah. Sorry, but, but I'm saying. He's in old. his 30s now. He's in his 30s. Yeah. I mean, my sisters, you know, my, when we were younger, we never really had much contact. Yes. And now I think my sister's in the mid to late 40s. Yeah. So it's kind of different. You, know, yeah. you kind of look out for each other and you kind of have that there. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your book because it's. You sent me this. I want you to be on the podcast to talk about martial arts. I never knew you wrote a new book. Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to talk about that, but this this book transformed the way I see you because I didn't know a lot of the things. I didn't know your your the story of your father mm -hmm. from Ghana, and when we first connected back, I talked to you about how I'd gone to Africa and it changed my life, and you mentioned you're going to Africa and you're mm -hmm. searching. I think I was probably searching for something going to Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think we all, I think we all are always searching for something. Right? If we're not, we're dead. Mm -hmm. right? And um, I read your book in four sittings, which I've never done with any book before in my life. It was so compelling and like just, I don't know, I, I don't know if everybody can see themselves in it, but your struggle where you don't really talk as much about searching for your debt early on, but you talk about this, this quest of being different. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the one time in my life that I, and this is going to sound really stupid, but the one time I felt truly comfortable in my skin and being who I am was when I was in Africa. And it, it's a weird statement being a white guy, right? But I, I don't see color. Like, I, you know, so many people say, oh, you know, I have a friend who's black. I never got that stupid thing of like this quote of how many gay friends do you have? How many black friends do you have? How many transgender because I think we're all one. And the one time I noticed that I felt so embraced and loved was when I landed in Kenya, when I breathed that African air. And your book is called, These Are African Hands. Tell me where that came from, like that, that idea that you look at your hands and you're like, these are African hands. Yeah. yeah. It was... Um, I was 13 years old. I was playing ball soccer down in front of my apartment with uh, another boy who, uh, who knew our family. And he says to me, your father's from Africa. And I said, what are you talking about? And I got kind of angry because I'm like, I'm wondering how he knew. And I didn't know about myself. And I was really upset. And I said, what do you mean he's from Africa? I said, who is he? He says, I don't know. He's not from Africa. So I kind of like, at the same time I was angry with him, I, I kind of was excited because something fresh and new about myself that I didn't realize. So I didn't tell my parents about what he'd said, but for about a week or two, I just sit there fantasizing that I'm African. I'm bigger than just this place that, you know, right. this small town that I'm trying to get out of now. So I kept looking at my hands secretly when I'm in the, when we're having dinner or I'm in the living room, I look at my hand and I just say, wow, these are African hands. Because I look at my knuckles and I look at the color of my hand and I think, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and being a fighter, yeah, like that's your hand, yeah, right, yeah, it's so powerful that it all comes through there. So when you first went to, have you ever, you'd never been to Africa before, never mm -hmm. fighting, vacation, nothing. Mm -hmm. 
So you went to Africa on the initial quest to find your father. Yeah. And what year was that? That was 80, 98. No, wait a second. 98. 98. 1998. And you went from Los Angeles yeah. to London. To London. To Ghana. To Ghana, yeah. Right? And just, I've talked about this a hundred times when people have asked me, and I've talked about it a million times anyway. Talk about the plane touching down and the first, and I don't think people get this who haven't been to Africa, that first breath that you take. Oh, man. It was, it's, it's, I don't know how to explain it, but it's, you, you step, I remember stepping out of the uh, airport to get the taxi, the cab, and it was, it was dawn. The sun was literally rising, right? And I'm, I step out with my family and I look out there and this is this hustle and bustle of the airport and the air and the sky and the sun, it just looks different. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to explain, you just feel this energy around you. And then we drove into, uh, into town and just, just experiencing the people and the lifestyle. But one of the things I really remember most of all is at night we have dinner and we sit outside and looking up at the sky, just seeing the stars. And just looking at the, looking at the uh, the heavens from from where you're standing in Africa, you just have to do that once in your life. Everybody, yeah. I said that. To, I said, you know, no matter what you do, if you stop with all the nonsense vacations, uh -huh. stop with Hawaii, stop with the Grand Canyon, stop with going to Disneyland, stop with all the nonsense, and save all those vacations together and take one trip to Africa, right? Just do that one time. Just go and. And just, I mean, I again, I, I said this, and people made fun of me for saying it, but I said, you know, I said, I believe we're all from Africa. We, we already know all life started in the Rift Valley. That's already been proven. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or Asian or whatever you are, your people at some point moved out of that center place where all life started. And that's that connection. I think that when you, if you can get that connection, if you can get there mentally and physically, mm -hmm. Then you look past all this nonsense, this black, white, gay, straight, you know, whatever, man, woman. I mean, we are one. I cut you open. I cut me open. My heart can go in you. Your liver can go in me. And it's this nonsense. Do you find that in, and you visit other countries after you went to Uganda as well, right? Yeah. Do you see that, that love that there are people always happy. They're always smiling. They live in the most abject of, of conditions, but they're smiling. They're living life in the moment, mm. like like Americans or Europeans don't. I mean, we both lived in Europe, and I just think these people are kind of stuck, mm. right? Well, that's one of the biggest things I saw when I was in Uganda because um, knowing the, the history of Uganda as other African nations, but Uganda has a horrendous history with Idi Amin and um, how many people died through that regime and how the, how the country um, has a massive trauma after that. So you think about how you can go through that, which was only a few decades ago, and they just go on with life as if everything's fine and beautiful and smiling, all the things you said. Yeah. Despite what they went through, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at what Rwanda went through. I mean, yeah. Rwanda had the, the genocide, yeah. and that was under Clinton's administration. That's even closer in, right? I mean, yeah. and that was a, my friend who took me around all to the, the guerrilla checking and everything. His he said, well, before we go anywhere, we're going to go to um, the, the the genocide museum. Mm -hmm. So we went from the airport to the genocide museum, and I had um, thirty five thousand dollars worth of camera gear. And I said, would you mind if we just carry that around? He said, it's totally safe here. And I said, no, 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 no. We, you got to take it, you know. And yeah. he said, no, 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 we're, totally safe. we're going to leave in the car. And I said, no. And so I insisted. So this poor guy, Jerry, who's probably watching the podcast because we've maintained our friendship, um, was carrying yeah, my Jerry. bag. Jerry, yep. <laughs> um, was carrying my bag and around. And he said to me later, you know, in, in Rwanda, we have no crime. You could be walking down the middle of the street in the middle of the night carrying money, gold, whatever. You will be safe. And I mean, this thing of coming together, it's, yeah. it's, it's coming together. And you see people there. I mean, there's, you know, there's a pregnant mom with a baby on her back 
uh, sweeping the street. I, mean, it's, it's, I think it's this ethic. And I think whether you're African or European or American or something, a good work ethic is, I think it's at, at your core, right? Yeah. And I think that goes back to, you know, the martial arts, back to work, back to, you know, you as a, as an amazing artist, like, like a painter. I mean, your stuff, your painting is just, I hope we can just put, put a couple pieces up in this podcast to show it. Um, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that you, you said you discovered your painting in like the 90s? 2002, three. And uh, where did you find them? Because I, I was a photographer as a kid, so I always had this in me to go to Africa and shoot these pictures. But you, how did you discover that? Um, I think I was always, I always had it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, and I was expressing it in my fighting, you know. I mean, all art is an expression. So I was doing it when I was fighting. Mm -hmm. And then I changed. I, I remember when I had my last fight, um, I just told myself, in the dressing room, this is going to be my last fight. I just signed it right then. So I left. I just knew I wanted to leave everything on the mat, like give it my all and leave my heart there to the sport that I love. And then I said, I want to, it's not an end, it's a beginning. So I thought I'm going to take that energy of the warrior into the next phase. This is when I moved to America. And um, I became... I was searching to be an actor, you know, which I loved, and I'm still an actor. You've but, been in several films, right? Yeah. And your, your guru, Milton Katsalas, who, who you wrote about, who I knew back in the day, was one of the most amazing acting teachers in the world. Yeah. And you were able to actually train directly with Milton Katsalas. Yeah. Which is 13 13 years. 13 years. Yeah. Okay. He was amazing. He was a guru. Um, yeah. He made such an influence on a lot of people. But he was, when I look back, he was a guru. Uh, <laughs> tough guy. But I loved, I loved his approach because he was like the boxing coaches of, and the, and the martial arts coaches that I knew so well. And I'm going to the acting class expecting something totally different. But then I feel like at home because he's like talking like as if we're in a, in a getting ready to go to do a fight. And I'm like, I like this guy. Did, did you find a similarity from martial arts to art to acting to to your, your searches for yeah. in life? I mean, yeah. is it, isn't it all a journey? They all connect. They all do. Oh yeah, they were all connected, and uh, you know, it took me a while to understand that. And, and but when you when you do understand that each one of them informs the other one, and it's hard to explain, but it's all an expression of yourself. So, I mean, in the mar as we've talked about in the book, um, in the martial arts, I'm doing Eastern boxing and I'm doing a Western boxing and doing Eastern martial arts at the same time, which is really crazy and mm -hmm. tough. But I couldn't do one without the other. I'm just drawn to do it. And I feel like that's the same way with the other things. I need, I need to, I can't just act. I've got to paint as well. Because when I'm painting, I, figure out, I can figure out what the character and the acting is going to do. Or the storytelling, or even writing this book mm. over the years when I've been acting, I've been thinking about the characters and what's driving them, and then I see the, the mirror and how that compares to my life, and I learn something about myself. Mm. And then I put that in the book years ago, and I'm writing about and so it all kind of like bleeds into one, one into the other. It's interesting. The story, uh, the, the, the way the book, it does kind of evolve. It kind of just really pulls you along and pulls you into this thing because you, you write it between chapters of boxing and then chapters of searching for your father and going back to, yeah. to Newcastle, right? And, and, and then being back in, in, in L.A., these, all these different things. It just keeps you engaged through it. Do you, do you think, cause it's funny, I, I've, you and I are so similar. It's so yeah. do, you see, do you think it's possible... And it's kind of a trick question because I, I, I have one, I have an answer to it, but there's a, there's a excuse for it. Is it possible to do these things at once? Like if you were going to be an actor, a painter, and a fighter, could you do all those three at once? I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I get tired sometimes, but I'm trying to. Right. I've tried not to, but it, I, I keep going back to it. It's crazy. Does one draw you more than the other? Like does one really make you more fulfilled 
I don't know. I, you know, obviously it used to be martial arts, but that's in mar- martial arts is in everything I do. But Mark, yeah, you're, you're doing martial arts now. I, yeah. mean, I really believe even when I'm training dogs, when I'm doing yeah. whatever, when, yeah. when I'm shooting pictures in Africa, like that's, that's Budo, yeah. right? That's yeah. Yeah. like, I think that Budo is in you. That's why I believe in this whole thing of like aliens. I just think there's these things. Somebody had this really interesting saying. He sent it to this, uh, the guy, Scott, who converted to Islam. That was his name is Ibrahim. He um, and I reconnected. He and I did martial arts in Florida in the heat. 15, 16 years old, 17 years old, we would be in the summer after, you know, when there was no school, we would be fighting full contact with our sentry red plastic gloves <laughs> on and our feet. And then we got finally got the, 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 um, the, the, the Bruce Lee gloves and we would just be fighting with just shorts on. And, you know, he and I reconnected and he sent me this thing. And this guy was talking how we can only see certain waves of light, right? But then we can hear other waves of light, mm. but there are these other waveforms in between that we can't see and we can't hear, but doesn't mean they don't exist, mm. right? Mm. Uh, this rabbi told me this story, he said, he goes, we know what we know and we know what we don't know, but we don't know what we don't know. That's right. And there's such depth mm. in that one piece, yeah. right, that, that these things, I think, somehow get inside of some of us. Maybe it's an infusion, maybe it's something God puts into us or whatever you believe in. But I think once that Budo spark is in you, mm-hmm. and there's been people who train martial arts for 10 years who never have it, and there's people who walk on the mat the first day and it's there. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's, I think once it's there, it's in everything you do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I mean, it's almost not possible to do yeah. what we do without it. That's right. Because I think that's because it's an expression of who we are. Whatever you're doing is. If it's coming through you, it's you, and whoever you are, it's going to show up in everything. Yeah, yeah, everything you do. So when um, when you so when you're doing your painting, you're doing martial arts. Yeah. When you're writing your book, you're doing martial arts. You're yeah. acting, you're doing martial arts. It, it's the one thing that, that separates you from everybody else because of the way you kind of pull it through, right? The way yeah. you yeah. harness it. Yeah, no. yeah. Do you ever, do you ever think, because I, I haven't seen you in 10 years, you still look exactly the same. You're one of the few people, I went to my high school reunion, there's one kid, uh, Kenny Kirch Merrick, and I looked at him and I was like, dude, you look exactly like you looked in high school. And you're that, you, you look exactly like you looked back in the day. I got the picture I'm going to put it up, <laughs> that I showed you when you got, we were in a magazine That's together. Great. But you it. still look the same. What, what do you, do you work out? Do you eat healthy? Do you, is it your mind? What is eat it? Healthy. I eat healthy. But I think your mind's important as well. Yeah. Do you um, think you're old? Like, do you look at yourself and go, man, I'm 50 something years old? Now. No, I don't. I, I kind of, um, I think aging is a social disease, you know, because people, I don't like to, I don't always tell people my age because I don't want to be in a place where people say, when you're at that age, you're supposed to be doing this, this, and this. But who made that rule? Mm-hmm. We're, we can live much longer and we can look great. And if you live a great lifestyle, if you live a healthy lifestyle, there's no reason. We're designed to live for a, a long time. So I, I go, I tell myself, I put myself on, a, on that schedule. There's a few books which I really read as well, which are really good, um, which is I'm blanking on right now, but we'll come back to that. Comes, um, yeah. Like, what was the main thing that influenced you to, because I can, I can trace it back, that influenced you to change, yeah. to evolve, yeah. and to become the person that you're today early on? Like, what, what, what was those little, because for me, it was for sure it was Bruce Lee. Yeah. Oh, and you wrote man. about Bruce Lee, because you went to see Enter Bruce. the Dragon a hundred times, right? Yeah, come on. <laughs> Bruce, that's our guy. Right? Is yeah. there anybody better than Bruce Lee? I mean, Bruce just, got us going. I mean, just was the guy that got you going. Bruce was a prophet. Bruce was like, you know, yeah. he's one of those guys that come into the world to change it, help yeah. to change it. And through that, he brought us, he brought us Taoism. For right? sure. For sure. Can you imagine if someone said to you, Without, let's suppose Bruce Lee's not in the world, and someone came up to you said, and said, be like water, and you go, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> right. But when Bruce Lee says it, that's cool. It's totally cool, right? 
the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. Yeah, you know, exactly. How many times did we read that book? Yeah, big time. So he influenced you big time. Yeah, sure. I mean, before I, Kung Fu, before you did your classes. Well, he no, I'd seen it, I'd seen his movie a couple of times before End of the Dragon. Yeah, and I think I was one of millions of kids who saw that and wanted to sign up. Yeah, and I did. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, I was in England, and you had to be 18 years old to see his movie because it was what they called X-rated, which is PG now. Oh, wow, really? So you had to be 18. So I was only like 12. So I was climbing up the, the back of the, the, in the <laughs> cinema. I'd climb up through the toilet window yeah. and then go see that movie about like 13, 14, 15 times, yeah. you know. And hiding in the, and once you're in, it doesn't matter, you're in. Right. You know. You got the stamp. <laughs> you got the stamp, that's it. That was it already. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he was, I mean, we'd never seen anything like him, had we? Because never. he was like, the way he looks and the whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. He was insane. Like I said, the kid, Scott, who now his name is Ibrahim, he, um, he literally looked like that. Yeah. In my high school, like, he was the kid who, Insane. I mean, he had that strength. He could go up to a street sign and pull himself and pull himself completely parallel. He'd do the thumb push ups. He, oh, he was in, like he, his body looked like. I just put it on the other night and when after I was reading that chapter in your book when you talked about Emily Dragon. I, I, I searched it and I, I said, Jan, we've got to watch this show. Women hate that movie. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they just hate that movie. And we were watching I looked and I was like, that's Some exactly movie. what Scott looked like back in the day. Like, that was insane. And that. His movements were like insane. It was like literally like just he would float. And it was so fast. Like his, the speed was incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. Uh, Bruce, yeah, he was, he was definitely here to change, to, to be a game changer yeah. for, for us. And the, and, the, and the age, right? Like, like he was 30, what was he, 30, 32, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 33 when he got when, killed, yeah. died, whatever. The, the, yeah. I'm not going to go into conspiracy thing, but. Like, I think it's something really amazing when you look at somebody at such a young age mm -hmm. to be able to change. And I think some of the people who have done some of the greatest changes in the world yeah. have been, you know, yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ or, or yeah. Bruce Lee. I'm not going to go on one book, but Malcolm you know, X, Malcolm Martin Luther X, King, right? Dr. King. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and, and Malcolm X. I mean, the, the autobiography of Malcolm X, one of the most amazing books I've ever read by Alex Haley, right? Yeah. Um, and I just thought, that's when you have this amazing power mm -hmm. and this gift from God. And I think it transcends all religion and everything. I mean, in my opinion, God is, the, you know, at the, at, at the bottom of the funnel. You can pour anything you want in, one, if God's going to come out. That's right. Right? And, and like you, this ability to change the world. And, I mean, we all have that ability, mm -hmm. right? And to do it at such a young age... Because, God, when I was 30, I mean, yeah, I was teaching martial arts, and I was doing stuff. You were, you know, world champion by then, weren't you? Yeah. Well, how old were you when you I was were? I, world champion 22 years old. 22, you yeah. were the world champion. Yeah. And how long did you fight after that? When did you fight? Because you said your last fight, you left it all on the mat. What year was that? I think it was 92. Okay. Yeah. And what was your decision when you went, like, did you think ahead, I'm going to do one more fight, I'm going to train? No, no. I didn't. I didn't. It was, I, was, I was literally in the, in the locker room getting changed for the fight when I made the decision right then. What fight was it? Um, it was a fight with Sewell. It was a guy, Tony Sewell, I fought three times, mm. you know, and um, we had some epic battles, and it was a great match. And we, I must say, that... Um, <laughs> I um, I just I heard a whisper in my ear. Just a whisper, whisper. Like that. And just felt wrong. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And it was it really impelled me to um, go out there. And it was and it's interesting because I've heard whispers in my head all the time. And I I, I put that in, I'm trying to put that in my book where my brain is talking to me and having the conversations. But I and I think some of the some of them are those whispers that I hear are for, are divinely um you know imbued by mm -hmm. you know something some higher power guide, yeah. guiding me. 
yeah. as we are all guided. Yeah, you got to believe in that. I, mean, yeah. I, just, I think it's an, it's a it's a vapid existence if we think it's just us. Yeah, oh, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like people who don't believe it. They think God, it's just. I mean, I don't. I'm not here to preach. I could care less what your belief is. Oh, but, yeah, too. You know, but I just think God, if, you, if that's it, if, if this is it, if yeah. this life is it, yeah. well, really, it's just such a waste of time, right? Oh yeah, big time, big time. Yeah, it's. It's just crazy to think about that, that some people do. And I think that's mm. where depression and, and sadness and all this really stems from, is these people who just have this mono, you know, existence theory. Yeah. Like, this is it. Okay, we're, yeah. when we die here, we, we, that's it. Yeah. And I think they just don't, they don't choose to accomplish things, they don't choose to do anything further than what they're doing, right? Mm. That's right, yeah. And, you know, you didn't write in your book at all about your art, your painting or anything like that. I just... Why? Um, I, I briefly talk about it in some of the conversations at higher ground. Mm -hmm. um, so it comes through a little bit there. But it's mostly about the philosophies of art mm -hmm. and the people who do art. So I kind of, I tr hopefully I got enough of it through, that con through those conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you don't go into the details of your shows and your paintings and all no. those things, right? No, yeah, I didn't go into the details of that. Yeah. I, it was all, um, I kind of tr tried to funnel whatever information was needed for those, and I, I didn't, I didn't want to go outside of. I mean, I could have talked a little bit about them, but I just didn't want to go outside of the parallels of uh, what the story I was yeah. trying to tell. I think it's amazing. It's yeah. such an amazing, amazing story. Now, when does the book hit the, the stores or Amazon or uh, Barnes and Noble? August 28th. Oh, August? Oh, no, sorry, no. March 28th. Oh, March 28th. I thought you said March. Yeah, okay, March 28th. Yeah, that's my son's birthday. That's why. I... On March 28th? Or August, 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 oh, August 28th. 28th. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's how you say that all day, August okay. 28th. Yeah, yeah. It's March 28th. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and then they'll be on, they'll be available on Amazon or at theseafricanhands.com. Okay, so okay, theseafricanhands.com, so yeah. they can get it. Are you doing yeah. signed copies? Yeah. Okay. Signed copies. If you go to theseafricanhands.com, you'll be, you'll be able to get a signed copy. And you uh, sorry, you got to do that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just an amazing book. I mean, I, I could talk to you for hours about Africa, about martial arts, about all stuff. This is just. A conversation getting us back together I and mean, I hope you'll come oh, back again so someday. much so much I mean I think that uh, you know hearing you say talk about the book is the main thing um, and any writer could wants to hear that you got a lot of a lot out of it that you couldn't put down it. I think I texted you three times yeah. while I was reading it it's just yeah. it's seriously an amazing book I mean I'm not saying it because you're my, my friend I'm gonna love you but I'm saying it because it's a life-changing book there's such I think anybody can get something out of it where it's, it just makes you connect to this inner piece of you. It makes you connect to, you know, who you are and who you struggle to be and who you, who you battle to be and all that stuff because that's something that we're all trying, we're always trying to get in touch with our inner selves, aren't we? Yeah. And I think you tapped into that in this, in this book. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it took a lot of work. 20 years you said you worked on those? 20, since 98 when I got back from England, when I got back from Africa and um, what happened was um, my grandmother died and my and I didn't find my father I don't want to give a story away. no don't let's not give a story but, but, the, but the fact with your grandma passing mm -hmm. and I didn't get it because when you said could you call her mom yeah right um, the, the question and this is I don't even know why I'm saying this in this in, in the book you, the, the statement is always our Kevin yeah right and I, it was repeated so many times yeah is that a, 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 a regional thing yeah it's okay. it's a colloquial okay you know enduring okay type of uh, thing we say to each other okay. so we'd say family members our Robert you know meaning like you're one of us ah and that I wanted to make sure I I and ha I had it in there because that's the irony of the story who do I belong to yeah yeah yeah. So that's that's why I kept that in there. I just loved it. It was so because at first I read it and I was like, well, our Kevin, why do you keep saying our Kevin? And then I realized that it just to me became such an endearing term yeah. to, to see yeah. it, to see these people say it over and over. And your mom and, and Sonia, yeah, who is Sonia. your mom, yeah, um, actually saying it. It was just so powerful. Yeah. Wow. And then, are you still in touch with Sonia, your mom? Well, we haven't spoken for a little while. Oh, okay. but you know, yeah. Less tough. I mean, 
I yeah. just, um, life is life. And you, I know how you are with your daughter, because I met your daughter when I had my dojo. Yeah. And you brought her by, and you're like the most amazing father. And you glow when you talk about her. You still now, because <laughs> I'm looking at you, you got this glow on you about you. about her. I mean, it's just it's such a great, great journey you've had. And we're about the same age. I mean, just yeah, that's not, right. not closing age, because I don't believe in either. You, geez, you have no lines on your skin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a lot of vanity. My, my uh, yeah, I asked my girlfriend, "What can I use? What can uh, I use? Give me some cream." Oh, so you do that, right? So yeah. You ask for these things. I, I said to my girlfriend, "Come on, you got any creams? Give me some. Yeah, yeah. Give me some knowledge. Give me some wisdom." Right, women are so wise. They're so that smart. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. I got. I mean, I got, Janet always says, "I run in the other room and shave, and that's it. I'm done." But <laughs> I'm going to do what you're doing. I'm going to ask Janet for some there secret creams, like yeah. eye cream. Right? Yeah, come like, on. I'm not worried about losing my hair. <laughs> you, I got to rock your look. Yeah, I'm going to shave it. Don't worry yeah. about it. Oh man! But you've always had your hair like like shaved. Uh, like, yeah, since I've known you. Yeah, since I've known you. I shaved it when I first moved to LA, and uh, okay. actually, it was my time in Africa. It was so hot. I shaved my head for the first time. You did it yourself just while you were there? Yeah, it was so hot. Because it was so hot. I was in Uganda. <laughs> and then I thought, hey, let's do it again. Yeah, Uganda is just an amazing country. I mean, yeah. I was there in 2018, mm -hmm. and it was epic. I went gorilla trekking. Yeah. I got, you saw the pictures on my side. Yeah. Oh, your photographs are amazing. The whole time. Yeah. It's, they're, they're, yeah. It's, it's, again, martial arts, you know. I got stuck going through to the, the impenetrable forest, uh -huh. and they said um, I was in Rwanda the year before, and they said, you know, if you want to do something, you should go to the habituation experience. And we're there, and I said, okay. And so they said, you know, hiking. Yeah, we met. We go hiking up the trail, and I'm hiking, and hiking, and about an hour and a half later, two, almost two hours into it, and they said, okay, we're here. And I said, where are the gorillas? And they said, oh no, no, we're at the beginning of the forest. <laughs> These guys are insane. Like, um, I, I got lucky because I paid the dues and nobody else came. There's supposed to be two other people there, so it's just yeah, me yeah. and six guides, yeah. right? Trekkers, guides, and, and, and guys with you know, machine guns. And, and Uganda is a pretty safe place to be relative. It's not like DRC or something. Right. Like and um, and I, I, every ounce of strength I had, I pulled within me to make to, for that strength to get through this getting up there to see these gorillas and this experience and I mean it's just I, I think everybody should ask about it. I, mean, I hate to say it. if did, I could do it I'd do it tomorrow. Did you have any fear when you were up there? Okay, so I'll tell you a story, right? So I'm, I'm up there and I said and I see these gorillas. Now here's the thing. The habituation experience is not quite what you think, right? So when you go to Rwanda, uh, yeah, Rwanda, um you go on a on a trekking. Then you get with a group and you go up and you see the gorillas and the gorillas see you and you see the gorillas and the gorillas are totally used to you being there. Okay? And when you do the habituation experience, you think, well, okay, we're going to go and we're going to have an experience with habituated gorillas. That's not what it is. You're actually helping them become habituated. So what they do the first year or so, they get in their presence and the gorillas see them and the gorillas run away. And then they come up again and they see them and they run away. And after about a year or so, the gorillas start to get less and less afraid of the people. Then they start bringing people in with them, right? And they, um, they, bring, they come closer and closer and closer, but the gorillas are not as habituated as they are in a regular gorilla trekking. So you're sitting, you know, you're sitting there in, in Rwanda, and you literally, the gorilla will come up to you and grab your arm or do whatever, or the silverback will brush up against you or something like that. Well, in Uganda, during the experience, we we're sitting there, and I, this one gorilla's in, and I've got a video, I'm going to show it to you if I can find it, and the, the gorilla's looking at me, and, I, and I've got my camera, and I said, are we okay? And he goes, Mm. 
charge. And I was like, we're in trouble. And he came through the brush, by the way. In Did you do any of the, did you go into any of the forest? No. no. Okay, so it's like bamboo like this, right? Which bamboo is insane, right? They're hacking, 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 hacking. That's one piece done. Yeah. Hacking, 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 one piece done. And so, goofy stuff. And so, this gorilla, 600 and something pounds, came through. I've never seen, you, the Jedi, didn't move that fast. Wow, really? He was on me, and I just, I spun around, and he grabbed one of the other guys, and they were fighting. He had a machete, and the gorilla grabbed his arm, and they were fighting for the machete. Yeah. And so the guy, you know, he won. I mean, I was just behind a tree. I was like, I don't want no part of this. And so the gorilla went back. He got thought, the guys on? He grabbed the guys up. 600 pounds of solid muscle. Like you've never seen this, right? I had one of them punch me, and I thought it was, it was, I've never been hit a lot of that. Wow. He grabbed the guys. I mean, they were wrestling for the machete. Yeah. Right? And he didn't get the machete, and then the gorilla took off. Uh-huh. And so I thought that the guy wants to go home, and so he goes, <laughs> Okay, let's keep going. And I thought I thought we were going to die, right? Yeah. I, I literally thought we were going to die. I thought that was it. A six hundred pound gorilla is going to kill me. And I got it on video. I got the video of the thing coming at me, and then he knocked my camera, knocked me wow. to the ground, and everything. And he, the guy said, "He goes, you're the first, you're the first white guy to give me pee his pants when that happened." And I said, "This happens often." He goes. <laughs> this is the habituation experience because <laughs> they're always challenging yeah, the guys yeah, to yeah, see yeah, if they yeah, really mean yeah, damage. But yeah. if they just wrestle around uh-huh. a little bit, it's a, jo- it's a joke. Wow! Because a gorilla could kill you like that. Of course, yeah. literally would take your head off like a, like a, like a freaking cork. Right? Yeah. But they're they This is their game. They want to see: Are you friendly? Are you really here to hurt me? And that's why he grabs a machete, and they're they're going around, and that that's the process. And this is life in the jungle right mm-hmm. this is kill or be killed mm-hmm. you know and, and this embracement of life because life life is so fragile you know right? it's just we should just go together we should, yeah i want to i, mean, I want to do that i mean i'm going to get I, i'm convincing wow. jen as soon as the covid thing is through, yeah. i mean i'm literally going to book my flight and be back i, I want to do it yeah, you got sure. it i mean the gorilla thing is insane. so was this in uganda that was in Uganda. That was my second trip. The first trip I was in Rwanda. Mm-hmm. And Rwanda, I went on the regular. Yeah. They, 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 all the gorillas were nice. They sat there. The young ones come up and grab your arm and whatever, play with like they grab one of the women there and then mm-hmm. drag them off to the mm-hmm. side. But to have a 600 some odd pound gorilla mm-hmm. storm you mm-hmm. through brush that you couldn't get through with like a machete. Wow. Insane. That martial is arts. insane. Yeah, yeah martial <laughs> arts. It's really martial arts. Well, knowing that you, there's nothing you can do to stop that thing. And there is, there is that, that moment. Because any person you're fighting, you know yeah. there's a chance. Oh, yeah. No matter how bad they yeah, are. You can't do it, right? This is 650 pounds of pure muscle just coming at you at lightning speed. You know, it's lightning speed. Good it's Lord. Insane. Yeah, that would have... Uh, it's life-changing. Forget it. It's like a bear, right? Yeah, but I don't think bears move that fast. Right. I really don't think, I think bears are much, much slower than gorillas. I think yeah. gorillas are one of the most, you know, apex warriors in the world. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, they're not yeah. meat eaters, I don't want to eat you, but they would, they could, you know, th- there's very few people who have been killed by the gorillas. There's they, few people that haven't been killed? Have been. Have been It's killed. very, very rare. I mean, yeah. The most dangerous thing in Africa, you know, are like mosquitoes and, and yeah. stuff like that, and people. I heard the hippos, because we went, we did go on a little um, two-way two-day getaway uh-huh. when we were in Uganda to a little safari mm-hmm. and they said that the hippos they freak out and eat you if you're in front of the water in your front of the water right yeah. so that's the key that's the key yeah. thing is if the water's here and the hippos there to go here because you they're afraid yeah the hippos are the most fearful animals so they're if you're they need to get to the water for safety so, so they freak out yeah so if you're between them and the water they have to kill you because they think you're going to keep them from getting to the water and that's where you know the whole idea of fighting from a place of fear yeah, oh, you know, okay. Somebody who's fighting for their life right. is a different fighter than somebody who's fighting for something else. Right? Uh huh. And and it's just sheer because of their sheer size. I mean, yeah. they're just huge, and they're just they just drag you in the water and drown you. Wow. Yeah, it's insane. But, wow. but hippos are yeah one of the more dangerous ones. All out of fear. Well, it's totally fear driven. Yeah, and if you ever watch them, you know, I mean, guy <laughs> played a joke on me. He said something like, <laughs> he goes, you know, oh, look at the hippos. He goes, there's no hippos, and he came up behind us. Crap out of it. I thought I was going to die. But yeah, hippos are hippos are scary, and I think that's 
Now, I didn't go anywhere as deep as you did, but I remember when I was in Uganda, when we did that two-day safari, I was thinking to myself, wow, I could die here. This is a totally different experience. This, I'm in, you just know you have to give respect, right? To the, to the environment, because you know you're in their environment. Yeah. All right, that's the feeling I got. Yeah, it's Down different. It's, and I just, you know, I think it's really sad that, you know, I, I talked to my buddy who was there, Andy. He's like, oh, when I was a kid, we would drive by and there would be elephants all the way down. You're just the elephants, elephants, elephants. Yeah. And now it's like, you know, elephants are, I mean, lions are greatly depleted, in, in more so than, than yeah. elephants. Yeah, lions and, and le leopards, not cheetahs. There are less lions and, 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 uh, and cheetahs than mm. there are elephants. Elephants are making a comeback. Mm. But, you know, you got to be really conscious of these things, that the world is a really delicate ecosystem. Yeah. You know, that you've got to embrace it. And, mm. and, and ecotourism in Africa is the number one thing driving it. Not big game hunting, yeah. we talk about all that, but ecotourism, where they give back. Like a lot of the places in Kenya, they, the, the Maasai villages, yeah. they employ the Maasai, and the Maasai are the most amazing people. Mm -hmm. The Messiah and the Samboro, the two tribes in northern and southern Kenya, um, are just like they're, they're supporting these communities. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know the big thing, the encroachment of like people in, they take their cattle in. A lion kills a cow, and then the Messiah go and they want to kill that lion. Right. But these eco tourist places say, hey, listen, you come to us, you show us the picture, because all everybody in Africa has got a cell phone, which is amazing, right? You're watching people, this guy in the Messiah thing, take his cell phone out, <laughs> this texting him. Yeah. They take the picture of the lion, they bring it to the the community, and they show the picture, and they'll they'll pay him for the cow. Mm. And the Maasai, uh, they, they, they extrapolate their wealth by how many cows they have, which is fantastic. Mm. And it's fantastic. Mm. If you're going to marry a, a Maasai br bride, you have to have bring some cows into the picture, right? That's like the dowry. Wow, yeah. And I learned so much. Right? It's a lifetime of stuff mm -hmm. to learn, to mm -hmm. talk about, and think about when, when it comes to Africa. Incredible. Yeah. Oh, you can see it in your photographs. Yeah. It tells so much of the story. Amazing. Well, your book, again, I mean, I want to close on, on that, that it's just an amazing, you really took me on the entire journey of your life. That, and I've known you for a long time, and I, I love you like a brother, but this just made me feel so much more connected to you and so much more understanding of what drives you, what made you become a world champion martial artist. I mean, the number one in the world. This book explains it, and whether you're training a dog or, or doing martial arts or doing, you know, going to work nine to five or being a musician or an actor, Reading has always been powerful to me because it lets you escape. Mm -hmm. And your book is probably one of the greatest escapes I've ever seen in my life where it pulled me in and took me on this journey and gave me the mindset of why are you the world champion? Why are you the best in the world with what you've done? And it's because of who you are. Mm -hmm. and, and you really explain that well in your book. So I, I hope anybody who reads this picks up a copy of the book. Is it on, available on Kindle too? Or you can it will be. Things. It'll be on everything. Yeah. You know what you should do? I'll give you a suggestion. I don't know if you've done it yet, but yeah. you should read it. You should do an audio book with your voice. Yeah. You've got to do that because your voice, your passion for it, if you haven't done it yet, you should call it. I haven't done it yet. I'll find the studio and do that. You, you should, should because yeah. I'm telling you, your voice, it's, it just will pull you through. You know, I knew you, so I, you were reading it to me while I was yeah, doing it. Yeah. But, but I, I think you'd be, I think you'd be well started. I'll do that for sure. I'll take your advice on that. And yeah. I totally appreciate what you're saying. Yeah. Thank it you. means so much to me. And thank you for having me here. Well, I appreciate love you, brother. Love you too, brother.